Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jeff Perlman. I'm one of the entrepreneurs introducing sessions, and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce today's session. My, uh, again, my name is Jeff Perlman. I'm the president and founder of Bright Power. Bright Power provides energy saving solutions for multifamily apartment buildings and a lot of affordable housing. So um, a lot of our work is uh, involved in providing both software and engineering services to make apartment buildings and affordable apartment buildings uh, more energy efficient and therefore more affordable. Um, I'll be uh, presenting on a later a panel later today um, about in the Cal room about uh, some of the work that we do in affordable housing. So I'm really, really pleased to be able to introduce this panel on the bottom of the US pyramid, frugal innovation for our communities. And uh, I'll now turn it over to Dan Crisofuli from Potrero Impact Advisors, who advises uh, investors on strategy for a maximum impact. So, thank you. Jeffrey, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, hearty souls who pride yourselves out of the festival hall and all the delicious food and networking to come over here and take a nice snooze uh, in, the, in the comfy seats. It's always the, the risk of uh, coming after lunch uh, in a big dark space. So uh, we're gonna try to keep this session as interactive as, as possible. We're gonna do some brief introductions of each of ours, ask a few questions of the panel, and then encourage all of you to participate. My experience at SOCAP is that uh, most of you could also be up here on the stage, and so we really encourage you to Think of questions, uh, stir the pot, and uh, we'll be looking forward to that uh, as uh, early in our uh, panel as possible. Uh, so the issue that really has bu been bugging me, I've, I've worked much of my career internationally uh, investing in companies serving the base of the pyramid in places like Africa and India. And in the past two years, I've been working increasingly in the US, and I'm seeing that we have 50 million or so Americans that lack access to healthcare, that lack access to the formal financial system, and don't have healthy foods. Uh, at the same time, we are seeing tremendous um, retreat in government services. The fabled safety net uh, is no longer frayed, it is getting shredded. Private companies, uh, are not developing the business models. They don't see the opportunities in serving this, uh, this market in the US. <clears throat> and philanthropy has seen a generation of investments, uh, frankly, being re reversed or even liquidated in terms of the progress they've seen, they've, they were building in many communities. Uh, to use Tom Friedman's term, we're waking up to a world that is flat. Thanks a lot for that, Tom. Uh, and how do we address it? How do we learn from, adapt uh, approaches that are f coming from emerging markets? How do we develop our own frugal innovations that are radically more cost effective, that are addressing the true needs of these communities uh, rather than just having innovation trickle down from the top, while at the same time recognizing that part of that $5 trillion market that World Resources Institute and IFC identified for the emerging markets base of the pyramid, $5 trillion is a lot of money. Well, a big chunk of that money, and I don't know the number for the US, a very large market size exists right here in the US uh, at, with our own low-income populations. So we are fortunate to have uh, a wonderful panel today, uh, each with a different slice in a key sector of the economy, uh, in financial services, in healthy food, food systems, and in healthcare. Uh, and we'll be looking at issues both in each of those uh, rather large industries and hopefully pulling out some cross-cutting issues uh, that each of them is facing, comparing and contrasting. Immediately to my left is Aryan Shutta, uh, who is the founder of Core VC, an investor in financial innovations that lower the cost and expand access to financial services uh, in US communities. Uh, Aryan, 
Can you make that a little more tangible to us? What is an example of a financial innovation that is increasing access to finance in low-income communities? It's after lunch. Make it, uh, make it exciting for us. Sure. Um, well, first of all, to, to make it concrete, uh, there, there's, there's a, a long-standing community development and financial inclusion movement in the U.S. That address, that's tried to address a real need, right? People don't have access to basic financial services. And I think one of our aha moments was to really understand this, that it's not just a need, but it is a tremendous opportunity. And it is a, uh, not just a, con a consumer market of people who are underserved and underbanked, but it is really an untapped opportunity. Uh, and just to give a feel in terms of uh, order of magnitude, uh, the underserved population in the United States uh, represents about a trillion dollars of income in aggregate and spends just on financial products, consumer finance products, $77 billion a year for fees and interest. So it's a big market, it's a growing market, uh, they spend a lot on financial services uh, and a lot of those are very inefficient. So to give a couple examples of what that means specifically, uh, we made an investment in a company called Rent Bureau. And Rent Bureau's business model is basically to collect rental payment data. Uh, one in three Americans uh, pay rent, and so there's no way for their on-time rental behavior to accrue to any positive manifestation the way my on-time mortgage payment does, right? That shows up in my credit score, which has an impact on any form of credit I get, insurance applications, job applications, uh, right? Without a credit score, you're basically without a face. So Rent Bureau collects from property managers uh, on-time and not on-time rental payments. Uh, we sold that company to Experian, and now 10 million people in the United States who pay their rent either on time or not, um, that data is reflected in their main file uh, Experian score. So it's totally invisible, but we think it has a real systemic impact in someone's life. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's one very specific, narrow example in which now someone's who's historically been off the grid responsible behavior can accrue to their... Uh, positive benefit. Thank you, Ariane. And I look forward to delving into some of those issues in greater detail. Uh, next uh, to Ariane is Kirsten Toby, CEO and co-founder of Revolution Foods, a local champion, uh, highly successful and growing company, serving over 200,000 meals, meals per day. Per day. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're interested in scale of impact, it's hard to beat Revolution Foods, particularly in the food sector. Uh, so a question to you, Kirsten. What were some of the biggest surprises that you encountered in building a company, a high growth company like yours, where others have feared to tread? Well, so I think for, for us, a couple of the big surprises were, were, you know, we started the company for a very specific reason. We saw this obesity epidemic that was, you know, starting to get a lot of visibility finally and you know not just because of the health impact but the financial impact on the healthcare system and um, so we, we set out to try to change the way that America eats because we saw this as this growing problem that's going to affect our kids futures and I, one of the biggest surprises we found is that we're actually building a big scalable company and a big part of that is the people in the company so we, we set out with this vision of impacting kids you know, kind of out there in the world. And, and what we've realized is we now have 900 plus employees. We have a whole community ourselves to take care of and, and attracting the right kinds of people into the right kinds of roles and setting them up for success. Um, it's, a, it's a big human challenge to, um, to navigate and to, to build to that scale. I mean, we've gone from, you know, zero to 900 employees in, in six years. So it's the, the, the sort of human capital challenges have, were, were something that we just didn't anticipate as we were, you know, thinking about this as this big, you know, vision of, of creating this impact. I think another, um, another thing that we've been really, you know, sort of pleasantly surprised by was, you know, we set out with this vision of, of changing the way that, that kids eat and, and increasing access to healthy foods. And we thought that was going to be really challenging in, in, you know, convincing kids to choose the healthier thing. And what we realized is that if you make good food taste good, if you make healthy food taste good, 
kids choose by what they taste and what they see and what the food looks like. It's, it's not, you know, we had, we had so many people tell us when we were first starting the company, well, kids will never choose to eat healthy food. Well, of course they won't choose to eat it if it tastes horrible. You know, it's, it's, it's really a matter of making, and so that was why we, you know, brought a chef into the mix and, and design every menu with kids' feedback in mind. And, you know, it's, it's that idea of kind of being in touch with who you're actually serving and, and respecting your, the, the consumer of your product as you're designing the product and not just designing some kind of big visionary, you know, organization that's going to change the world. It's really thinking about who you're serving um, that has been, that's been a, a kind of a game-changing perspective shift that we've put onto the building of the organization. That's fantastic. And Kirsten, I had the pleasure of, of first meeting you when you won the Global Social Venture Competition at Berkeley a few years ago, mm -hmm. and I voted for you. So <laughs> that, just, just to go on record with that. Um, and it's just been amazing to watch their trajectory. Um, they're definitely going up the hockey stick. Uh, next is James McGowan, Managing Director of Security Research Associates. Uh, they're an investment bank uh, meeting the needs of companies and funds in the areas of housing, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and inclusive finance and health. Uh, James, I know you've been involved in bringing base of the pyramid model from emerging markets that has succeeded there and bring that into the U.S. market. I'd love for you to talk about some of the challenges you've seen in that process. Sure. Um, thank you for, for that uh, introduction. Um, I come to this from an investor's uh, standpoint. So I'm, I'm looking at the opportunity from, from an investment standpoint. And when a social entrepreneur named David Green uh, came to me, uh, having succeeded in innovating in, in eye care and, and achieving uh, global scale in, in the areas of blindness. Um, he came to me with a, with a product and an idea to solve the issue of 600 million people in the world not having access to hearing. Uh, 600 million people hard of hearing, of which 200 million are, are severe, and those people are in the US and they're, they're all over the world. Um, and so David and his partner, Stavros Basea, set about to make a company that could succeed around the world, and they figured if they could design it for India uh, with an Indian rural customer in mind and get the price point right for India, they could succeed not just in India but in Africa uh, and also here at, uh, at home in the US and in developed markets. Uh, because the same problems that affect uh, someone uh, in, in India also affect us here. Um, price being a big one. Um, in, in the US, um, the average hearing aid costs between $1,500 and $2,000 per year. Um, and it's not covered by design by the, the medical establishment, um, and therefore out of reach to, to just about everybody. Um, and so you had to get the price down radically uh, if you were going to succeed in, in India and also in, in the US. And so for David and Stavros, that meant uh, a, a 10x reduction in cost and a 1,000x uh, speeding up of the time to delivering a working product. So pretty, pretty big. Uh, changes in usability and affordability. That, that's pretty amazing. And we've heard these stories from Aravind and, and David Green is, is a repeat entrepreneur in the base of, uh, base of the pyramid space. Um, and to see those in, innovations come into the US, uh, uh, I'd love to hear more about that as we go into our discussion. Um, I guess the first question would be, uh, some of the tensions that you see when you're trying to both do well, you're, you're offering intentionally a product or service that you hope has a positive social or environmental impact, but you're also trying to uh, do well as a business, make money for your investors, satisfy venture investors, uh, and uh, what are some of the tensions that you've seen around that issue? Sure, I mean, I can, I can speak to that because, I mean, in the case of Conversion Sound, 
um, there had been investors in the company, there had been grantors to the company, so foundations had come and helped to develop the product with an eye toward uh, serving very low income customers. So there had been grant money that had been received by the, the corporation, so it was set up as a for-profit corporation, but foundations had, had written grants to the company to support the product development, and once that product worked, a lot of those same foundations came back and invested equity um, and, and when it, the product was really working, um, we could look to more commercial-oriented investors um, in, for the opportunity. And in fact, um, you would think that there would be a great amount of, of, of tension but, uh, in terms of setting prices um, and, and profits. But in this market, um, if you want to succeed, you have to have a radical reduction in price in order to succeed. Uh, it, it, you're not going to serve low-income customers charging them uh, $1,500, $2,000. So that tension kind of goes away because um, without a low-cost product, you can't serve a low-income market. I mean, it sort of seems obvious, but so you have to design a, a, a wide enough delivery system, a wide enough distribution system that you can make money at scale and not on, on the margin uh, of each product uh, sold. I can address a different side of that, uh, that tension, and we experience that quite significantly, both in raising money for the fund as well as deploying the money for the fund. Uh, so we're a double bottom line fund, right? We're looking to make uh, market rate returns or above market rate returns, and we are intending to make tangible, measurable, scalable, positive social impact on low income people's lives. And I can't tell you how many times when we went out and you know pitched our fund, we'd have this kind of lean-in moment uh, where the investor would say, okay, Ariane, that's good and well, but really, is this about making money or is this about doing good? And it's a, uh, it's a question I reject kind of intellectually because I think you should be able to do both. But uh, I think for us, a real aha moment was to say that, that, that the question doesn't just come from a, a narrow-mindedness. The question comes from the reality that most people aren't good at either, right? Most people aren't good <laughs> at making money when you really push it, and most people aren't really good at doing good if you really were to you know, look at social change. Um, so uh, kind of getting our heads around that to realize that it is quite a reasonable um, uh, pushback, uh, I think was, was a good aha for us. Um, and then you know, there's also, I think I realized, a, a multi-hundred year legacy in the United States of people doing well first, making money first, and doing philanthropic later, right? Kind of doing good and well in serial as opposed to in parallel. And so, you know, it's a, it's a deeply counterintuitive idea. And I think it, it, it improved our fund offering in that we really, I think, tightened our thinking around, you know, is this, a, is this a ludicrous proposition that we're trying to do here? Or are there ways that we can actually align do-gooderism with financial returns? And, you know, it didn't require a, a radical departure from the way we approach this fund, but it, de it definitely... Uh, tightened our thinking in making sure that we look at entrepreneurs whose business models, whose enterprise value is heightened when they're doing things that are good for people. So decreasing costs or increasing assets or increasing access to credit or mainstream financial services. Um, and I very much believe that that is operative in our space. I don't know if it's operative everywhere, um, but it's certainly something to be aware of You know, when you approach a double bottom line business. So I'm hearing similar messages from both James and, and Ariane in that the, the social benefit needs to be baked into the business plan, which is making money. So it's not a separate, it's not a divergent stream, but it's part and parcel of the core model. Baked in and enhancing, right? Mm -hmm. it, it needs to, right, the more good needs to needs to maximize the return, needs to increase the, the enterprise value. And Kirsten, I suspect you disagree completely. <laughs> well, I, I actually agree abs wholeheartedly. I think what we've, what we've you know, been able to do in building our 
company and, and also raising the money to support the growth of the company is that, you know, I think what investors tend to look for is you look for an opportunity, like an unmet need, and you look for a large market. And what we saw out in the, you know, when we started looking at what's happening and, and what's causing kids to make the choices that they're making and what they're eating, both in school and out of school, is that there's a big unmet need in the fact that, I mean, how many people love what their kids are eating at school for school meals? So the huge unmet need, it's a, you know, $25 billion market just looking at school meal program in itself. And then when you look at the issue of, of healthy eating and how many, you know, how many parents struggle to get their kids to eat healthfully at home, there's, there's a huge opportunity there. And so it's, so, I mean, it's, it's a very similar kind of a notion of that you're, you're taking, taking this notion and building a business around an idea that the, the more the business grows, the more positive impact you're having because what you're providing is inherently better than the alternative is, it, I mean, that's, that's been, I think, what's been the compelling kind of piece of, of, for our investors who've invested in our, um, in our company is that, you know, we're as the, the more kids that we can impact, the more schools that we work with, the more kids we're seeing who are staying awake in class in the afternoons and able to perform on their tests and more kids who are you know, having fewer days of absences because they're actually staying healthier. And um, so, there's, so there's an inherent social impact to, you know, the, the scale of our company and, and every, you know, every child, every school that we work with has a, both a positive social benefit. There's also this interesting phenomenon, and, and I think this is sort of typical of, um, of bottom of the pyramid entities in general, that your, our economics are actually driven by serving larger low-income urban schools. So the, the, so our, our economics actually, the economics of our business actually kind of work the best in schools that have high participation levels in their lunch programs, which tend to be, you know, schools that have high percentage of their kids qualifying for free lunches, which is exactly equal to kids who are low income to moderate income um, families. And so there's, so there's a, a, a very direct kind of economic link between the success of our business being driven by you know, the, the more presence we have in low income urban communities. That's great. I'm going to ask one more question and I'll encourage you to ask the next question. And I'd also, Bjorn, our uh, Mr. Microphone, uh, will be moving to the open Q&A uh, pretty quickly. Uh, in emerging markets, we've seen the need for significant uh, investment in market creation, creating new markets where no one uh, previously tread uh, can be very expensive. And I've seen grant funding going alongside investment for many years to patiently begin to create those markets. I'm wondering if you're seeing that same effect here what role does education play in market creation? Is that something that you can bring within your bottom line, or do you need external resources to achieve that? In, in our space, you know, people's knee-jerk reaction when thinking about financial inclusion is financial literacy. And I'm not sure this addresses the market creation part as much as you were talking about, but certainly the kind of the education capability in, in, in our area, I think is a total misnomer, right? Because by hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent by well-intended financial institutions to include the, you know, the, the masses and help them understand the bank's, you know, uh, prescient offerings better by delivering financial literacy programs. And sadly, you know, the, the correlation between information delivered and behavior changed is almost zero. And so, I, in my mind, it's an entirely futile effort. Uh, that is a very logical go-to kind of conclusion that everyone reaches. Uh, that is actually much better uh, addressed by offering a better product uh, to a customer who's actually quite sophisticated and making quite rational choices and who chooses not to work with a bank for very logical and good reasons. Uh, and instead to use that product as a, as a carrier of financial literacy kind of at the right time and in the right place, right? So kind of to give a, an example out of my life, which is very different uh, than most of the customers we serve, right? Like I, I'm a sophisticated party supposedly, but I really had no idea what a mortgage was until I needed a mortgage, right? Then suddenly I learned a lot about a mortgage because it was relevant to me and actionable today. 
And so similarly, right, most financial education is not actionable and relevant to most people today because of millions of factors. But if you can, at a check cashing transaction, for example, when someone comes in after a couple times, right, say, well, perhaps you could, instead of cashing this check, uh, you could deposit the value of this check on a prepaid card, which can then serve as a pseudo banking relationship, right, that is, that's very local, it's very relevant, it's a small piece of financial literacy that's kind of in the right time at the right place. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a very scalable and actionable and tangible uh, market-making form of educating. And it's, again, baked into the business model. So the, the same thing with the, the example from, from Conversion Sound, from hearing, um, it's very much product and needs driven. Um, one of the reasons people don't access hearing, we've mentioned the cost, but one of the other factors that, that drives the fact that people don't hear is they don't know where to access an audiologist. I mean, how many of you know a good audiologist? I mean, I mean unless you're already in the medical channel, you have money and you're hard of hearing, you're not going to know. Um, so there was a problem in, in, in India, of course, of not having an installed base of audiologists. It's less of a problem in the United States. Um, but if you're going to then have a new model, then how are you going to get to that market? Um, and you have to look at new partners. Do you partner with Walmart? Do you partner with Minute Clinic? Do you partner with a cell phone company? Because the, the hearing test actually can be administered on your cell phone uh, without the need for an audiologist for a large percentage of the cases, you can actually deliver. And, and because of the design of the system, you don't need three trips to have your ear fitted. You can have an injection mold made on the spot, and you can hear in 30 minutes instead of 23, 24 days. So again, uh, if you design it for the end user um, and with their needs in mind, uh, available everywhere where they need it, you don't have to educate them, they'll figure it out for themselves. And I, I think it's the, the, the idea of education is only as good as it is relevant and as the solution is accessible, right? I think that's, we've, we've made nutrition education a, a sort of integral part of what we do with schools. And we've actually been asked sometimes, you know, oh, well, why don't you kind of, you know, make your nutrition education curriculum something that you kind of make available to, um, to schools across the country. And I mean, while it's certainly a great idea, if it's not actionable, I mean, I think it's such a, it's such a good point that if it's not actionable and if you're, one of the reasons why we started what we're doing what we're doing is that we had, you know, physical education teachers and health teachers in schools telling us, I'm teaching all these great units in my school about eating healthy and eating your fruits and vegetables. And then I have kids come up to me in the lunchroom. And we had, we had a couple of teachers tell us that they stopped going into the lunchroom because the kids were coming to the lunchroom and saying, if you're teaching me this one thing in class, why are you serving me? Because kids don't make the, they don't know who makes the decisions in their school. Why are you serving me this, which you're telling me not to eat when you're, you know, when you're teaching me? So, so that having the education be relevant in the moment, we've actually done a lot of work around looking at how can we how can we actually make our, our our food be an education piece, whether it's through the packaging or through, you know, just the idea that kids are tasting new things is an educational process if you make them aware of it. Um, and you're and we're and part of our education is actually about changing palates and getting kids, you know, the more kids taste um, new foods and and you know they get accustomed to different flavors and less salt and and all those kinds of things. So it's a I think education is great as long as people can take action on what they're learning. And, and the same thing is happening, you know, out in the, if you educate consumers about healthy eating and healthy shopping, if they don't have a grocery store that has fresh fruit and vegetables in their neighborhood, they're not gonna be able to make the healthiest choices just because they don't have access to the, the products that you're telling them that they should be eating. I mean, so that's, that's one of the next needs that we're actually looking at is the fact that families in the schools that we're working in often don't have access to healthy you know, food within their communities in a reasonable radius of where they can drive or walk. And so we're starting to make, you know, plans to make our meals available to families outside of the school, you know, for dinner, for weekends, for, um, you know, as a, as a home cooking kit and things like that, because we have parents saying, you know, this is great what you're serving my kid at lunch, but how can I serve it to my husband or to my, you know, my other kids who are, you know, 19 or 20 years old and going to community college? Well, well, sign me up for that service. <laughs> uh, we could definitely benefit. Are you? Yeah. 
this is a, this is a, a bit of a weird panel in that we're all different disciplines. But one of the what I like about it actually, and I wish I had more to report on uh, what I like about it, is that I feel like there's there's at least from my sector there's so much to learn both in health and in uh, nutrition that can be used in financial services. So like when you're talking about changing people's palates, you know like we have the same problem, right? We can design better financial products all day long, but people go get payday loans. I'm not making them, no one's making them, but they're doing it because their, their financial palette is adapted to, right? So how do you change those things? And similarly, you know, for example, I'm, I'm entirely excited about uh, the Nike Fuel bracelet. You guys familiar with that? Right, like, so Nike has this little bracelet and uh, it, it connects into your, into your iPhone and it basically serves the, the purpose of making immediate and tangible something that is, slight, is important but broad and ineffable, right? I want to lose a couple pounds, uh, right? Which is kind of a broad goal. I want to, you know, uh, but, you know, how do you make that? How do you take such an amorphous goal and, and actualize that on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Having something that you physically wear on you and you can physically see a little display and it goes from red to green as you move and it's imperfect in its, in its measurement entirely. But still, you know, it, it does something that makes, again, concrete and measurable and localized, uh, you know, something as ineffable in a goal. And it's, it's, some, it's the same set of issues we have in financial services. And people set financial goals around how much they want to save or debt they want to reduce. And these are kind of large ineffable goals that when you just get in the run of the day, you forget about and it's hard to change your behaviors. And you know, I'd love to see a Nike Fuel bracelet for, you know, for debt reduction. You don't need to go to a debt consolidator. So if you've got, uh, so if you've got near a, uh, a payday loan, it would turn bright red and start an alarm <laughs> would, would, uh, would, uh, would flash at you. Is that what you think? Yeah. Okay. Why not? That's good. Like that. yeah. Well, I'm getting flashing red lights that it's time to open up to the audience. Uh, and I'm wondering if we have any first questions. I think you were first. Is that, is that David? <laughs> it's very hard for us to see you. There are very bright lights. Oh, sure, sure. Hi, uh, David Erickson with the Federal Reserve. And, and um, this is a great panel. Thank you very much. And I, I, I was reminded of something that some from the Midyar network last night was talking about how they look for a revolutionary business and then that would sort of build the sector and that kind of creates the impact through sort of sector development. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you think your sector is and who are your partners and competitors in there and what are the trends that are sort of driving changes in your business model? Well, you're clearly sector focused, Ariane. Do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Uh, I'm not sure I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm getting the essence of your question, but you know, my, my sector goes by different names, right? Historically, it goes by community development or you know, some people call it financial inclusion. Uh, I call it, you know, I've kind of gotten used to a more secularized language. I, you know, we're in the consumer finance business. Uh, now we're targeting lower income consumers, but uh, you know, anyway, whatever. Uh, so, and who, who are competitors? Uh, you know, what's exciting actually, and the, uh, something that I think gives our, our investment thesis credibility is that uh, you know, not just by, from a policy perspective are these consumers underserved, but actually, you know, if you look at all venture capital and where it's allocated, only 2% of all of venture capital is allocated in financial services, period. Not, not bottom of the pyramid, just all financial services. So there's a relative dearth of money going into financial innovation, which is good in many regards, because financial innovation is by and large an oxymoron in my mind. Um, but you know, so there is, there is a very small subset of other investors who are fintech investors who look at companies like we do. I think we're the only one in the country that's focused on fintech for the underbank. So if you define it very narrowly, we don't have any competitors as a fund. Um, but we co-invest with a lot of others uh, who may also have an interest in this. And they include the Sequoias and the Venrocks and the uh, Greylocks of the world, kind of just traditional funds. Tanya, I think it was interesting that it's discussion we had last night about the community development field hmm. and how you became a bit frustrated with the approaches that have failed to scale and how you see uh, new models, more entrepreneurial approaches offering the opportunity for larger impact. Yes, that's a good point. So that, that thank you. That, so, so another side of, of, of our space 
is that, uh, is that area. And so I kind of cut my teeth in this sector at Shorebank, uh, you know, which really kind of created the community development uh, space in the US. And you know, by our back of the envelope analysis, when you add up all the shore banks, even though that particular institution is no longer, uh, you know, it represents, they serve about 1% or not even 1% of the population. And so, you know, my, my frustration with that whole sector, even though they're doing incredible work in many ways, is that it just doesn't scale. And the priority at the end of the day amongst entrepreneurs and leaders in that sector is more on, uh, on place-based, deep work with communities than it is on um, scaling nationally. Uh, you know, and so our funds, our, our fund's belief is that to create real social change, you really need to scale to serve millions because one in four Americans is underserved by traditional financial services and pays through the nose for very basic stuff and is getting behind as opposed to getting ahead just around their financial instruments. So the sector question is a really good one. I think we actually, we're, we're creating kind of a new type of organization that spans across three different sectors. I think we're, we consider ourselves a part of the, I mean, we're obviously in the food business, so we're, we produce and deliver food. So I have to say that we're part of the food, um, the food industry, but we're a very different kind of a food company in the way that we're, we're you know, both educational and production oriented. So we're, you know, producing food from scratch, delivering it. Um, and, and creating a whole new model of how kids can access healthy food um, and how that we can expand that to families accessing healthy food. We're also, we consider ourselves a, when, when you ask our schools, they would say that we're their health and wellness partner. So I think, you know, in, in, a, in a way we're kind of changing, we're, we're one of the kind of, you know, prevention um, based healthcare <laughs> companies that's out there that's saying, you know, if you, if you eat a healthy diet and live a healthy lifestyle, you will actually reduce both your own personal cost and the sort of country's cost of uh, supporting your health care bills. Um, and then finally, we're, we, you know, I'm an educator as a, my, my training was as an educator and I, I was a teacher before starting this company. So we definitely consider ourselves an education reform organization. And we're, you know, we, we sort of, we operate and live in the, in a world that's, you know, very, um, you know, we surround ourselves by education leaders and, and you know, we're, the impact that we're having is, is an academic impact as well as a, and that's, you know, really at the end of the day, that's why we started the company, is we want to see kids succeed in school. And we believe that food and nutrition play a really important part in that, um, in that equation. So, so it's, you know, I think that we play in three different sectors, but I think, and, and in that sense, we don't really have a lot of direct competition of anyone who's trying to do, who's trying to tackle the problem from a similar angle. So it sounds like you could eventually crowd in competition uh, and that often is a sign of the success sure. when others are, are trying to uh, crowd into the space. Yeah. Uh, James? I mean, as, as my role as an investment banker, uh, I look personally for companies and funds that have ideas that are going to be transformational for their, their industry. And then we look to find the right investors uh, who understand that model and want to participate in that. And so in that sense, we would go out to the community, a lot of you are here in this room, um, for the best ideas that we have that are relevant to what you're interested in, whether that's uh, inclusive finance, uh, whether that's low income housing, whether that's renewable energy, or whether that's healthcare. Um, in, the, in the healthcare space, uh, you know, there is a huge need that the, for money that is aligned with a different mission of simply looking at the market from the old uh, high margin, um, low volume approach. Um, that, you know, that, that there is not an enormous amount of capital yet deployed in that market. And we're hoping that with examples of companies like Conversion Sound, um, like the companies that David Green has helped found, uh, that there will be other um, successor competitors in those markets and we'll be able to help bring capital to those companies with aligned investors uh, going forward. I think we think it's, it's one of the ways to attract big problems. It's a way for foundations also, if they want to invest, uh, to multiply their, their grant giving and have it have massive impacts in terms of, of uh, the quality of life, uh, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. 
Interesting, on the healthcare note, uh, I am involved in advising a, a startup healthcare finance organization which sees very much this gap in support for the next generation business models that are uh, creating highly scalable approaches that both increase access to low income communities while improving the quality of cost, uh, quality and cost effectiveness. And uh, frankly, there are very few funders, investors that are playing in that, and we would love to see more folks crowding in. Um, yes, I think there was the person over here was next. First of all, I want to say um, thank you. I'm really excited about this panel because it's not often that you find something where people are focused on alleviating poverty in the U.S. And to that question, um, in terms of getting foundations or impact investors to buy into poverty alleviation programs in the U.S., how do you go about competing for the dollars um, and the attention of these foundations who want to do good, but they're very focused on whether it's Africa or Southeast Asia, South America, all great causes, um, but there are, but we seem to be in the minority in terms of focusing on poverty alleviation here. Yeah, good, good question. <laughs> you know, clearly financial inclusion globally is a very exciting topic uh, and a very depressing topic because it's, you know, there are pressing issues. Uh, and, you know, if you just look from a financial perspective that are much more pressing abroad than here. Uh, but that's not to say that they aren't pressing here. And, um, you know, I think it, it, that's a work in progress. And it's been difficult for us to really educate that our backyard is important uh, and that the situation is dire uh, and is worth paying attention here. But, you know, I don't think we've been particularly successful at, at uh, getting folks who look internationally to let go of their money here. I think we've basically looked for other people who are interested here and who have, who, who, uh, uh, yeah, who care about here. Um, but I think it's, I think it's, it, it, it's important to do, right? Because I think it's, we'll, ha, we'll I, I always like the story of Al Gore going out to India to, you know, talk to them about their global, uh, you know, about their emission uh, contributions and them basically sending him home saying, you know, you guys are the biggest polluter. Why don't you, why don't you, you know, clean up your own act and then come back. Uh, and to me, that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, if we can, we can be, we can, uh, we can export a lot of really great talent and great ideas. Um, but I think we would do so with much greater integrity if we actually had our act uh, a little bit more together. And you know, it, it, it's pretty, it's pretty bad what's going on here in terms of the income gap and in terms of you know the eroding middle class. Uh, so we, we sometimes try and make those connections, but by and large. Uh, you know, we're, we've found a different set of stakeholders who care about the United States. Well, we now see that emerging nations, such as India, uh, are, have, they have the same per capita income that the United Kingdom had in, in the late 1940s. So those countries, even though the, the wealth is highly, uh, the Gini coefficient is quite high, am I getting the, the directionality right? Uh, there's a lot of income inequality the average level is, 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 is where we were just a generation or two ago. And it becomes harder to justify international aid in that, in that, in that context. Um, and I think more investors I'm seeing anecdotally are waking up to the needs of communities uh, around job creation, around new paradigms in these areas that we're talking. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the sort of things that inspired me to be part of starting Revolution Foods was I spent time in Africa, in West Africa, working on um, school lunch programs in Ghana. And I was, you know, there looking at helping the, the Ghanaian Health Service to figure out how they could scale the, the these, this one very successful school feeding program that had been established to other parts of the country. And, you know, I, I came home really inspired and, and feeling like, wow, there's a there's some great work going on there. You know, I, I wonder what's going on with school meals here in the U.S. And I was, um, you know, living here in the Bay Area at the time and and saw that there are some, you know, some there were, this was, you know, eight, nine years ago, there were some amazing efforts going on that were incredibly localized and incredible, um, incredibly, you know, impactful in a very, very small, at a very, very small scale within, you know, in parts of the Bay Area. 
And that was one of the things that you know we started talking about. Was there is, you know, when you look at what was going on in Berkeley 10 years ago versus what was going on in Oakland, and right next door you have this amazing edible schoolyard program in Berkeley, and you know kids in Oakland are are you know suffering from type 2 diabetes at the age of nine or 10 years old. And um, so we set out to create this model that was that was scalable and that was addressing the, the needs of, of the you know, kids who need it most in the US. And I think it's, it's true that there are certain foundations that are very focused on supporting work internationally and other foundations that are very focused on supporting work um, domestically in the US and, and addressing poverty related issues here. And, and we've had great success partnering with some of those foundations who are, who are here. I mean, Kellogg Foundation has, has a, a huge focus on nutrition and, um, and has been instrumental in helping us to to scale into places like New Orleans, where we may not otherwise be able to, um, you know, afford to build a culinary center because it's just not as big of a market for us. Um, and then we also have seen, you know, pretty um, substantial um, foundation and, and municipal support for the fact that we're creating jobs and, you know, that part of poverty alleviation, in you know, the focus here needs to be on job creation and uh, and the fact that we've now created, you know. Of our 900 jobs, you know, probably 80, 85 percent of those are are people who are working, you know, who may have been working very unstable jobs or were unemployed before they came to to join our team. And so that's that's part of you know in my very first comment. Part of what we learned is that we're not just you know we're not just creating this impact on kids out in schools. We also are creating and we have the opportunity to create these you know real good sustainable jobs with opportunities for people to grow and learn and and move up, especially because we're a growing company. Um, so, so we have found that a lot of the kind of foundation support is actually on the side of, of supporting us to create great jobs and provide great programs for the employees that we have um, to, you know, move forward in life and, and reach their life goals. I would just, I would just add to that that, um, I and mean, I think we, if you hang out at SoCap, you, you come to the conclusion perhaps that all philanthropic dollars are going into, into some um, very cool development project in, in Africa. Uh, but I think if you look overall at giving in the United States, you know, 90 plus percent is, is going to domestic, um, to, to domestic sources. It is true that there is perhaps less innovation um, for some of the domestic funders in terms of funding enterprises. And I think we can all be uh, advocates uh, for those foundations that we do um, run across to say, look, put some tiny uh, amount of your uh, giving or some tiny amount of your corpus into some kind of investment that is being reinvested in enterprises at home that are solving the, the problems that you want to solve. Um, and you'd be shocked at the number of very large foundations that um, this is just beginning to occur to them that they could do this. So I think there's a huge opportunity ahead to have those positive conversations about how those uh, foundations can help uh, bring innovation forward to solve some of those big problems in areas like health or education or, or financial inclusion. Yeah, to add to that, I think that's a great point, actually, and one that is relevant in our case. We, now, now you mention it, you know, some of our LPs actually uh, are active. Your investors. Our investors are active in um, in international markets, and part of our argument was to say, you know, there are actually tremendous importable ideas. Uh, so, you know, let us be your kind of domestic microfinance effort, or right, your your domestic, uh, and and even though the United States in kind of apparently obvious ways has a more sophisticated financial uh, infrastructure. It is also light years behind the rest of the world. Uh, and there are actually tremendous uh, importable ideas. So that, that's very true. That's great. In the back. Hi, thanks. Um, one of the things I hear said, and I'd like to know if you guys agree with this premise, is that to have a really successful business um, focused on bottom of the pyramid in the U.S., you have to have a business that also captures like middle class, but ha happens to also bring with it the bottom of the pyramid. I think you need to hold it close to your. Oh, yeah. is this better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the tip. Um, did you hear the first part of the question? Okay. So, um, do you agree with that premise? And then, if so, how do you advise 
your entrepreneurs or as an entrepreneur stay focused on iterating the product for the bottom of the pyramid opposed to getting distracted by the higher up? Uh, may I? Sure. So in, in our case, uh, I'd say my answer would be yes and no. Uh, we see two categories of companies. We see companies that basically serve low-income people exclusively, uh, and then we see companies who are serving a broader consumer set, including low moderate income, and we're interested in both. Uh, and uh, on the former, the, the, the folks who are just serving the underserved, if you will, uh, one of the things that we found as a, as a happy uh, after effect is something my wife has kindly called the Sesame Street effect, which is you know, kind of Sesame Street wasn't, was designed to basically be in like an after school program for low income or black kids in you know, urban communities. And it turns out we all grew up on Sesame Street. And so similarly, right, there's lots of innovations that are really designed for and relevant to low income, right? Like my uh, rental payment thing, it was really designed to be, you know, over optimizing low income people. It's actually a tremendously benefit for me, right? Like I rent in New York and so uh, I benefit from that as well. And so I think, you know, what is the case in, in kind of, you know, creating something that for a specific community that has specific needs will rise the tide for everybody. Uh, and that's super true in our space. So if, you're, if you have something just focused on, on LMI, on low moderate income, I think there's a, there's a much bigger impact. And I think uh, an entrepreneur who's doing that would be wise to pitch those kind of externalities. Um, and someone who's looking at a broader consumer segment uh, should pitch the kind of the broader appeal. Um, Fair enough, but I think about medical devices, it could be a little threatening to an incumbent supplier of the device that costs 10 times what your device costs right. to have that innovation. How does that, how does that market uh, dynamic play out? Right. H hugely threatening. In fact, when, when Conversion Sound went to go talk to all the hearing aid companies, they said, well, if we invested in your company, you would destroy us, so we're not going to invest with you. Um, I mean, that, that, that is very clear that um, if, if the product succeeds as well as it does, uh, there is certainly threat to the entrenched market. Uh, we think there's, there, there will always be room for, for both, but I think if you design with the low-income consumer in mind, um, and the quality is extremely high, and the service delivery is very good, um, then I think you will find that um, not just low-income consumers, but middle and upper-income consumers will avail themselves of the product as well. Uh, you may be giving up some of the extra margin that you could be charging to those higher-income consumers if, you, if you're pricing it for that low-income uh, customer, uh, but that you can sometimes manage that, that by, by channels and geographies and, and added features so that you can deliver the product that works for the low-income consumer. You can add features or other externalities or other services for middle-income consumers uh, so that you can develop the right product mix. Um, interestingly, the way that the David Green model works in India is they give away a third of the product to people who can't afford it a third of it is priced below cost, and a third of it is charged well above margin, and they can still make um, very healthy uh, returns on, on, effectively returns on equity uh, with the markets that are left over, simply because the market is so large if you price it that affordably. And I think it's, I, I like the, the term the Sesame Street effect. I mean, our, what, what we've done is designed, we, we designed for, we designed our, our meal program so that it was accessible to kids who are on the National School Lunch Program, which means kids who are living at 130% or below the, the poverty line. But we which, designed which it. Is, what, $15,000? It's, it depends on the size of the family, Something but it's, like yeah, I mean, it's astonishingly, person, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's um, astonishingly low, the, the, you know, and, and the number of, people who are, who are on that, I mean, it's close to half of kids qualify. So, um, so we designed it so that, you know, cost-wise, it's accessible to kids who are dependent on that as their source of, of, you know, a meal at school. But we designed it with, a, with an ingredient integrity that, you know, we're serving, the, we're serving some of the highest income schools in California and some of the highest income, um, you know, districts in, in other parts of the country. So there's, there's a, a, I think there is a, there's a sort of high quality, low cost balance that if you can get it right and you, you know, design other costs out of the system that are not as necessary, 
then there's no reason why you shouldn't be looking at you know middle class, upper class customers in addition to you know having something that's affordable for um, for the you know sort of bottom of the pyramid population. So in our mind, it's actually a, a real validation that we have kids in Hillsborough, California, eating our meals, and we have kids in Harlem, you know, eating our meals, and they're, it's exactly the same food. But it's, you know, it, it, there's actually a real validation that, that's, that it's good enough for these guys and it's good enough and affordable enough for, for, for these guys. And I mean, frankly, that's part of our social mission is, is you know, equal access is really important um, for, for us and for, you know, to feel good about what we're doing. But also it's, it's just critical because kids, you know, kids aren't, don't, yeah, they're not born into a socioeconomic class. They just kind of inherit it, right? I mean, they're, um, they didn't ask for it and they, they deserve the best. <clears throat> I mean, that's how we knew, that's how we knew um, the conversion sound thing was going to work because uh, we did uh, focus groups, the clients did focus groups, um, and they took high-income consumers who were using the state-of-the-art technology, and a number of them said, I'm going to drop my $3,000, $2,000 device for this you know, $100, $200 device, and I like it better. You know? um, and so it has, has to be high quality. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's really inspiring stuff. Uh, Jeffrey? So um, I, I'm interested in the question from a business perspective, who's your customer? Because um, we heard each of you talk about, say, in the financial innovation space, uh, how you know, your customer ultimately, well, while it might be benefiting the low-income community and that's where the impact is, your customer was the credit bureau. Or from a school lunch perspective, you're feeding kids, but your customer is probably the school mm -hmm. itself. Or from a hearing aid, Maybe it's more the end user, but still the audiologist needs to sell your product. And so, you know, which customer do you focus on to have the biggest impact? So our, our model is, I mean, it's, it's very similar to sort of a retail food or a you know, consumer product model where you know, you're, in, 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 and I was sort of shocked when I first heard this and I got into the, the world of consumer packaged goods, but your customer is the buyer at the store that you're selling to, right? But your consumer is the person who's pulling it <coughs> off the shelf. And, and in our world, it's, it's, it's exactly the same way. There's a decision maker at the school who decides whether or not to bring our program in, but they're basing their decision on how much the kids are responding to the program. So, um, and then, you know, we obviously have other folks who are kind of influencers in the whole process, which are parents and community members and faculty, and they may not be direct decision makers, but they're but they're influencing. So, I mean, I think in any in any kind of a business, you probably have multiple people that are you know engaged in, involved in making the decision of you know what you're doing. But but we're pretty clear about our customer being the decision maker at a school, but our consumer being equally important as the student. That's great. Please. So you guys are all working in fields where. Um, making a profit is very closely aligned with making a difference. And in other fields that's less closely aligned, sometimes it's diametrically opposed, sometimes it's fairly well aligned. A lot of what we've heard people say at this conference when talking about serving uh, poor people internationally is that you know they've been the sort of forgotten market, that people have not realized the kind of profits that you could make from this billion people on the planet. In the United States, that's not really true. I think there's a huge amount of um, marketing and businesses targeted at poor people in this country. So my question is, do you guys think that you, you've shown that there's still, um, there's still business opportunities, but do you think that this is a broad, untapped market where there's lots of potential, or has the potential been somewhat fairly well explored by large companies like, I mean, I even want to say Walmart. Um, that's my question. Thanks. That's interesting. The, uh, we had a discussion previously about cross-cutting issues that touched each of the sectors and companies, and the Walmart effect was one of those. So, Sure. I mean, we actually, um, in, in a way, the conversion sound hearing aid is designed with Walmart in mind that, that it's a low-cost product that could go into a, a Walmart uh, department, a drugstore, um, and be sold not by an audiologist, which answers the previous question, would be sold not by an audiologist, but somebody with maybe a week's worth of training. Um, and that would allow you to uh, address that market uh, d directly. 
um, I, I think that there is, um, th I think you have to, to think about it um, with those kinds of partners in mind. It's a great question, and it is, and it does strike me as one that's different in the U.S. than in other places. Uh, you know, we often refer to our consumer market uh, as the underbanked, and you know, many of them, ironically, are actually overbanked, and then we call them underserved. And you know, when you think about it, they're actually very well served. They're just served by people we don't like, or whose pricing we don't like, or whose products we don't like. Uh, so we really think of them as inefficiently served, and the market opportunity is huge, because by and large, right, the, there's. We, we see missionaries and mercenaries. The missionaries are the do-gooders, the shore banks of the world, who are doing great stuff locally, but don't scale by and large. And there's the mercenaries who basically don't care about the welfare of the customer. They say, need, they'll serve it. They're the payday lenders, right? Stereotypes. Um, and uh, by and large, the mercenaries in our space are, run incredibly inefficient businesses. Their fixed overhead costs are very high. Their loss rates are incredibly high. Basically, they don't use technology for their, for, their, uh, for their solutions. And so, you know, the lowest income people pay the price. Uh, so we see a huge opportunity to kind of, you know, find a new breed of not missionary or mercenary, but we like to think of them as visionaries who bring this value set and this kind of set of commercial capabilities and sensibilities and will, will drive efficiencies. Uh, and, there's multi-billion dollar businesses to do that here in the U.S. in, in, in consumer finance. Kirsten, I see a lot of nodding. Mm. Well, I've, yeah, a lot of thoughts on the, on the question. I, I think that, because I know we don't have much more time left, I think fundamentally we, have a, we do have a very different kind of market structure in our country than, than what's happening in the rest of the world. And, and I, think the, I, I think what I would hope and what I would predict is going to happen over the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years is that some of the companies who have, I think, I mean, Dan raised the question of externalities. I mean, some of the, what's, some of the, the business in, that's been built on the backs of the, of the sort of poorest of the poor in the U.S. is a very damaging business to, in terms of health and, um, and other impacts on the, on the community. So, you know, and I'm thinking about, first it was the cigarette industry, then it was, now it's, you know, soda and candy and, um, and all of the overly sweetened beverage, beverages and things like that. Um, so I, I'm, I hope that there will be a shift for, for, you know, that sector. I don't know what that shift is going to look like, if it's going to be policy driven, if it's going to be consumer driven, if it's going to be demand driven. Um, but hopefully that shift will, will start to kind of make room in the market for responsible businesses to serve, you know, the real needs of those communities rather than kind of exploiting the profit opportunity there. That's great. One of the issues which we did not have time to cover in the session was the, pol the role of policy, public policy at the local, state, federal level, which is very different in the U.S. Uh, uh, compared to emerging markets. Uh, it's one where you do have policies that many times inhibit the positive impacts that we would like to see, and there's a real role for engagement with, with government there. Um, we are now out of time. I would say that my intention with this session was to shine some light on some of these amazing examples that we're seeing unfolding here in the United States with that some who, that have achieved significant scale, have tremendous potential for further growth, maybe attracting more of those bright entrepreneurs and those savvy investors to tap into these sometimes complex but ultimately high opportunity markets for both financial and social impact. Thank you very much.